Amen. Lord Jesus, we declare your lordship over this place. We declare your ownership over our lives. Lord, we declare this morning that you indeed are Lord of all. And everyone who believes this said a big amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Christ Community Church. Thank you, music team. Wonderful job this morning. Good to see you guys. Let me jump right into the announcement about Dennis Kramer coming on Saturday the 23rd. We believe that God uses his people today to speak on his behalf. You could say it like in terms of being, quote, prophets. A lot of us have ideas of prophets being these guys and these uh, garbs that, uh, you know, with the long uh, bony finger that point and just declare people, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Old Testament prophets may have done that, but in the New Testament, it's a whole different spirit. It's a whole different way. The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 14, that uh, when we give prophecy, it's to be encouraging, comforting, and exhorting. So the Word of God tells us through Old Testament and New Testament, God's desire is for every person to be prophetic. You guys catch that? Every person to be prophetic. Every person who is alive in Christ, who's given their life to Jesus Christ, you have a chance to be prophetic. You can speak on God's behalf. You can declare God's word in situations. It's so much fun. We'll talk about this in a moment, about faith speaking. But I want to encourage you. We will spend thousands of dollars to go to football games. We will spend hundreds of dollars to go to concerts. We'll spend hundreds of dollars to go eat at a restaurant. And we're asking you to come and spend a Saturday, a few hours, so that you can increase your ability to let God use you in a supernatural way. I think it's time well spent. I think it's money well spent. I think it's that. Let me just give you a deal. Pastor Dina will pay you back if you don't like the school, okay? If you don't like the school, she'll reimburse you. So we'll take care of it that way. How's that? So everybody sign up, and I was just teasing. She, she didn't say that. Moving right on, the Bible tells us this. Let's jump into the message. I'm so excited. We had a wonderful first service. I believe it would be even as good or better the second service. But the Bible's full of all kinds of things about faith. And I love talking about faith because faith is the vitamin C of your Christian walk. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot know God. Without faith, you can't have an understanding of how to trust Him and rely upon Him. And so I believe that we can safely say every person in this room has faith. The question is, where do you put your faith? Where do you apply your faith? How, does you, how do you know you have faith? Well, the, Bible's, the Bible gives us clear indications of how to tell people who are of faith. Listen to what it says in the book of Luke. It goes on to tell us this in Luke 6.45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. Now, how many know a good man can't bring forth evil, an evil man can't bring forth good? That's what the Bible says. But how do you know if someone is good, or how do you know if someone is evil? Well, it tells you, it gives you the clue. It says, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Or to put it in this way, the overflow, the abundance. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, his, man speak, uh, his mouth speaks. The Word of God tells you and I human nature. You and I can discover, after five minutes of conversation, we can usually find out what people worship. Whatever they worship, adore, give their life to, what's, in, what's, the, what's the paramount thing of importance in their life, they will talk about. Get around certain people, it's their sports teams. You just hang out with them for five minutes, it's all sports, 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 sports. You get around other people, and it's all about their money. It's all about how much money they're making or they've lost or they've won or what they've accumulated, et cetera, et cetera. You talk to, you talk to other people and they'll tell you all about their position and their status and their, their, uh, their social relationships and who they know and they're a name dropper and they give you all this stuff. For other people, believe it or not, a lot of people tell you about their anger, depression, worry, all those things. Are you guys following me? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But this one guy was telling me this, and I was fasting. So I started getting with people and just talking to them. And sure enough, you could find out when people worship their drugs, all they're talking about is their drugs. When people talk about, you know, especially, now this is not bad, but if you know, you're with a parent or grandparent, talk about their kids and grandkids, it's okay. But when those things take the place of or dominate your thinking or they become your life, it's out of order. And I'm not talking about just relationships. I'm talking about across the board and the things in your life. And so God's always having to adjust us and tweak us. And so you can tell where people are, where yourself is, by what you talk about. A lot of times in our culture, we talk a lot of fear. 
We're always talking about bad things. You know, let me tell you how it works. I was riding my bicycle the day, got out and took a bike ride, and all I could think about was, you know, as I was going down a hill, I pick up a little bit of speed, I keep thinking about, I don't want to wreck. And I just think, you know, it's so amazing. I've been riding a bike. As you can tell, I'm pretty old. I've been riding a bike for a long time. Would you like to know how many bike ride, or bike, bicycle accidents I've had? Probably, well, lately a couple, but it's just growing up. <laughs> growing up, I haven't had that many. And I'm thinking, where does this thought come from? I'm just going down the hill. Any grown person should be able to get on a bicycle, go down the hill, and not think about wiping out. But yet we got this fear factor in our brains. We're just so afraid of what's going to happen. But as people, as men and women of faith, we have to be of a different spirit. We have to be of a different culture, a different kingdom, a different style of believing and thinking and speaking. But it says it's out of the overflow, it's out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So if my nature is filled with worry, what am I going to speak about? Worry. If my nature is filled with anxiety or depression or anger or fear, what am I going to speak about? I'm going to speak about those things. But if my nature is filled with God, with Jesus, then in the midst of circumstances, what flows out is not going to be fear, worry, anger, depression. It's going to be God's word, God's peace, God's love, God's gentleness. We need more people in the body of Christ to be speaking God's word into situations. We don't need to be agreeing with our culture. We are countercultural. We are counter kingdom. We have a different allegiance. We have a different faith. We have a different spirit than our culture. Let us be men and women who walk and talk our faith. Let us be men and women who give ourselves to letting God overflow out of our lives. Now let me just, just, just put a boundary around this because there's so many things that go on. There's a lot of times you get people that talk religion, talk uh, church, talk Bible, and it's just an excuse to avoid the reality of what they're facing. For instance, if you're lazy and you don't want to work, then you're going to quote all these Bible verses on why it's a day of rest and you don't need to work. But that's not the Bible. The Bible tells you and I, Jesus said, if any man wants to be great in your midst, let him become your servant. If any man wants to be your teacher, let him become your slave. Last time I looked, slaves and servants work. That went over really good. When you're in the kingdom of God, you're in the kingdom of God, God has to train us to take on the characteristics, the qualities that are valuable in God's sight. And God wants us to be sincere. And so when you're out speaking and teaching and sharing, it should come out of a lifestyle that reflects what you're speaking and teaching and sharing. And I'm trying to give you indications. The Bible says an evil man brings forth that which is evil. A good man brings forth that which is good. You know, when I gave my life to Christ, I found this out. When I gave my life to Christ, before I came to Christ, my life was filled with just long periods of selfish choices. And every once in a while I was interrupted by good deeds. After I gave my life to Christ, my life was filled with good deeds interrupted by short periods of selfish choices. And I'm still making selfish choices, but they're getting smaller and smaller. They're not like it used to be. You know, in this church, you can say amen or oh my. So either way, you can go either way, amen or oh my. But one of the things that God's after is that God says to me, Mitch, as my son, I want you to be like my son, Jesus. I want you to walk like him, talk like him. And did you know when God speaks, and we'll talk about this in our first, that faith speaks, did you know that God doesn't speak in just King James English? You know, back in the early days, in the early days of the charismatic movement, you could always tell when somebody had a prophecy. They'd say, thus saith the Lord, if the Lord hath would say to his people. And they would go through this long King James, thing, and you knew, whoa, that's the Lord, the Lord speaks. Did you know that God can speak in more than just King James English? Did you know that the Lord can speak? And I'm telling you, he speaks to me with a southern accent, so I get it. He says, son, you being selfish. Oh, I got that. I got it. You got a bad attitude. Straighten up. God has ways of communicating with us. He has ways of talking to us. So when we talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ, 
we're talking about faith speaking, we're talking about people who understand that God is requiring of me something that goes beyond just mere speech. It's an overflow of my life. Listen to what it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Let me just talk about this for one second. When it talks about this, is I was raised in a Baptist church, and we use this scripture all the time, but no one ever explained to me lordship. That's not an American cultural ideal, lordship. We like politicians because we can vote them in or vote them out of office. You can't vote Jesus into office or vote him out of office. The word Lord means sovereign, king, master. I was driving to church this morning listening to one of these radio preachers, and sometimes radio preachers are pretty good. I was listening to a radio preacher, and he was talking about when you say Jesus is the shepherd of your life and you're his sheep, did you know that sheep are property of the shepherd? Did you know that sheep go where the shepherd leads them? Did you know that sheep have a master? When you declare Jesus is Lord, you're saying Jesus is my master. You're declaring to Jesus that I'm your property. When you say Jesus is Lord, do you know there's a guy in England named Prince Charles? You know, he's not my prince. I'm not English. I'm under that government. He can be prince of whatever he wants to be prince of. Lord bless Prince Charles. But if I were to say to you, Jesus is Lord, that's a title and that's nice. You know what changes? When you declare Jesus is my Lord. Now I've put myself under his lordship. I've declared myself to be his property. He's my master. It means that I've given up all my entitlement. It means that Jesus... Because I've confessed you as my Lord, I am now your property. I'm now your servant. I'm now walking with you. I am doing my best to obey you and walk with you and follow you. So here's what happens when you have that type of commitment. You'll begin to find out that you're going to be able to speak what God speaks. Why is that? Because you're not speaking your own mind and your own will. You're speaking God's will. You're going to find out that as you continue to walk with God, that when you speak, that God gives you an authority and God gives you a power and God gives you a passion you didn't have before because it's not you speaking, it's Him speaking through you. You realize that you've been bought with a price, that you're glorifying God with your speech and your actions and your deeds. You realize that life is no longer about you. And in our American culture, that just runs counterculture. We want life to be all about us and my needs and my wants and my desires. We're all about serving self. We're a consumer-driven culture. And God's looking for the body of Christ to be countercultural. God's looking for the body of Christ not to be consumer-driven. God's looking for you and I to look for ways that we can serve and share and speak and declare and be the vessels of God that God wants for our generation. Just talked to a young man just earlier in this service, between services, battling drug addiction. We have people live streaming. They're going through all kinds of problems in life. We have people that are going through marital problems. We got people going through divorce issues. We got people that are going through raising their kids. We have people uh, that are just all these struggles with finances. We got people on health issues. Guys, we need the body of Christ. We need believers of Christ to know who they are in Christ and to speak what God speaks, to say what God says, and to do it the way Jesus would do it. We are in that dire need, and we need. We need the body of Christ to stand up and begin to declare what God says. Let me just go through why speech is so important. The Bible tells us in Romans, it says, when you profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, it says you're saved. The word saved there is being made whole, being made complete. Eternal life is when you give your life to Christ, you have eternal life. You will go immediately to heaven. The word saved has a different implication. It says that while we're here on earth, God is working out of us all the impurities, all the defilements, all the things that cause us harm and heartache, that God says we're being saved. The old, uh, the old uh, if you would, the old time Methodist would tell you, we're being sanctified. What does that mean? That means that God is just purifying you of all the stuff that you gave your life to. Because when you give your heart to Christ, it doesn't change your mind. Your mind is still filled with memories and thoughts and pattern and belief and issues and behaviors, and it takes a while for your mind to catch up with your heart. 
That's why the Bible says don't believe in your mind. It says believe with your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. That's why it says in Luke, it says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So faith is a heart issue, not a mind issue. And when Christ fills your heart, when Jesus fills your life, when he fills the substance of who you are, you will find out your speech will change automatically. Now, you may not be perfect. You may still may curse and you still may say a few uh, uh, snotty things to people and snide things to people. And you may share some things with people you wish you hadn't said. But I will tell you, as a person who's a follower of Christ, you will find out those times will grow littler and littler and littler. And your times of blessing, encouraging, and sharing, and loving people will increase, increase, increase. Because that's the nature of who Jesus is. Look at these examples in the Bible as we go through this real quick. It tells us in 1 Timothy 6.12, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I can just tell you this, that one of the greatest things to do is confess Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. It's also one of the greatest blessings when God's able to use you to be a blessing and an encouragement to those around you. The Bible tells us in Exodus 5.1, it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go. Pharaoh represents the type of Satan. Egypt represents bondage. And all of us, the Bible says, that we were all slaves, if you would, in Egypt. All of us were bound as slaves to sin. But God sent a man. He sent a man named Moses and his brother Aaron. And they came with the word of the Lord, and they went right up to, to Pharaoh, to Satan, if you would, and said to him, God has a word for you. It's, let my people go. And God is speaking to you and I today. Whatever bondages are in your life, whatever problems you're facing, whatever uh, slavery you find yourself enslaved to, God is looking for an Aaron and a Moses to speak the word of the Lord. He's looking for those that will challenge the system and say, you know what, God says there's a greater life, there's a greater peace, there's a greater joy for you when you find your life in Christ. You don't have to find happiness in the bottom, uh, in the bottom of a bottle. You don't have to find happiness in some pill or some addiction. You can find happiness through following Christ, loving Him, enjoying Him, serving Him. You will find out that the system you serve makes you miserable. Would you agree with me the people who were enslaved to Pharaoh were miserable? Yes. Would you agree with me, people that you're around you in your culture, in your neighborhood, at work, when they're enslaved to drugs, would you say they're miserable? Yes. Would you say people who are involved in all kinds of bondages, would their life be enjoyable? No. And I'm trying to encourage you this morning, as the body of Christ, we have the awesome privilege, we have the awesome joy of speaking and sharing words of life with those around us. There's a different way to live. And so Moses and Pharaoh, uh, Moses and Aaron spoke to Pharaoh. And when they did, guess what happened for the people of Israel? Things got worse. How many of you have ever started to follow Christ? You start to follow Christ and your life got worse. People say, well, that's really encouraging. That really makes people want to serve Christ. Well, it says that things got worse, but God was up to something. And God did a great deliverance and delivered Israel. We know the whole story of how the children of Israel left Egypt and they were loaded down with gold and silver and clothing because God set his people free. I can tell you this, when you serve Christ and you're doing a breakaway from the bondages and you're doing a breakaway from the slavery and the corruption that, that holds you in bondage, God does some amazing things. Let me put a little boundary around this too. I've just got to share this. You know, in a charismatic church, you've got a lot of people always say, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said. Let me just say it this way. Moses put his life on the line when he walked in to Pharaoh. If he did not hear from God, he was dead. How many of you would be willing to take that kind of risk? Not many of us. So in charismatic churches, you have a lot of people that are looking for ways to say the Lord said because they want to get their way. So if you're in a disagreement with them on how to do things, and you're in this disagreement, the religious spirit will say to you, well, the Lord told me, the Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says. The Lord told me to wear these socks. The Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to do that. And it's just a religious spirit. God didn't tell you that. But i got to say it as a balance to that. One Sunday morning I was getting up, and I thought the Lord told me, put on a suit. Now, you know, I like casual clothing. I like this kind of just come in, just kind of be relaxed. Southern roots, whatever. And I feel like the Lord said, put on your suit. And I'm like, 
can't be God. That can't be what, but anyway, so I was like, okay, so I put on my suit, came to church without knowing it. ABC News had sent a national crew down from New York City about the Jerry Sandusky fallout. And the reporter came in and said, can we use your church as a service to talk about what's going on in State College with the whole Jerry Sandusky fallout because we want to give a report of what God's saying to the churches. I was like, sure, I'm dressed for the part, yeah. Even though it wasn't planned, God knew. Now they shot the, they shot the stuff and just to finish the story, I'm thinking, you know what, they're not going to put that on national news. You know, forget that. That's not going to happen. They're going to edit it and it's not going to happen. I get a call from my aunt in Tennessee. She was so excited because she saw me on national news sharing about what God was doing in our community, how God called us to love people and stand in blood, et cetera. So I'm just saying to you, so sometimes it is good for the Lord to tell you what socks to wear, okay? I get that. But the point is, is when there's a disagreement, a religious spirit always uses the name of the Lord. And when you talk to them and they say, God told me, how do you know that's like that trump card? You can't top that. If God told you, who am I to argue with God? So let me just throw out just, just a safety measure for you. Be very careful how you use the name of the Lord. Be very sensitive how you use the name of the Lord. I had rather you say, I think the Lord's speaking to me. I have a desire. I think this is God. I believe this. Then to come up and just say, the Lord told me, and you just go right ahead. Because a lot of times it's not the Lord, it's your opinion. A lot of times you're using, if you would, God's name in vain. And the name of the Lord is holy. The name of the Lord is reverent. The name of the Lord is powerful. The name of the Lord is to be set apart. Old Testament priests wouldn't even pronounce God's name. When they're writing the scriptures and they're rewriting the scrolls and they're writing the Old Testament books, there were a lot of times when they came to the Lord's name, they would use the pen, write his name, and they'd throw the pen away because they didn't want to defile the Lord's name. That's how they treated reverentially the name of the Lord. Let it not be said in charismatic churches that we just throw God's name around loosely. Let us treat it with honor. And when you say the Lord told me, make sure it's the Lord. So when you come to Dennis Kramer, he's going to help you understand all that. Okay, moving right along. The Bible goes on to say another example of speech. 1 Samuel 17, 45, story you're familiar with. David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, the guy that some Bible theologians say was over 10 feet tall. They said, you come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. It's interesting that David, when he spoke, he ran into battle. He took the giant on. I mean, know that if David was wrong, it would cost him his life. That's why many of you and I would be hiding in the rocks of the rest of Saul's army, the armies of Israel. Because if we were wrong, we would be dead, and I don't want to take that chance. But David got the word of the Lord. Because he had a prophetic word from Samuel the prophet. Samuel the prophet spoke to him and said, David, you're my man. I've anointed you. I've called you. You're going to be the king of this nation. I've anointed you with my spirit. So when David goes out to battle and he sees this giant railing against the things of God and the nature of God, the anointing of God rose up on the inside of him and he said something has to be done. God said, I'm going to use you. So he ran into battle with a confession. He says, you come to me with all your weapons, but I've come to you in the greatest name given among men, the name of Jesus Christ. If you would, I'm going to defeat you. I'm going to cut your head off, and we will see who is God. The word of God. God has incredible promises for you and I. And when you get that anointing, you speak his word, God just does some incredible things. You'll see the giants in your life topple that's a word right now let me just tell you that God loves you so much that God wants to destroy the things that are bringing misery into your life we had this but I'm going to say it again on live streaming we have thousands of people watching us on live streaming and I just want to say this if you've given up hope you get a hold of that number get a hold of us because I'm telling you God's got a purpose for your life do not throw your life away God has some incredible things he's doing for his people. Listen to what the centurion said in Luke 7, 7, talking about faith speaks. He said this, this is what I did not even consider, this is why I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. 
but say the word, talking to Jesus, but Jesus say the word, and my servant will be healed. The Bible tells us in Psalms 107, 20, it says he sent his word and healed them. Did you know right now God the Holy Spirit can take the word of God and bring healing to your life? Felt the Lord spoke to me early before the service. We're not going to end the service on a, healing, on a healing note. But if you have, I feel like, irregular heartbeat, you get dizzy, have a little fainting, this kind of stuff, if you'll just put your hand on your heart and just believe, say, God, just send your word and bring healing to my heart. God, just send word. If you've got any other physical problems in your body you'd like to see healed, just let the Lord just touch you now. Just God, just send your word and just bring healing. Lord, just thank you in Jesus' name for my shoulder. Thank you for my, you, you just go through the list of whatever it is and just say, God, just thank you. Just send your word and bring healing to my body. That's what the centurion told Jesus. He said, speak the word only. Jesus, you don't have to come lay hands on my servant. Just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. So that's how powerful God's word is. God wants us this. But let me tell you the most powerful confession you can make. The most powerful thing you can make is what the apostle Peter did when he was talking to Jesus in Matthew 16, 15, he said this. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Did you know I've observed in our culture, in American culture, we have a lot of people that like a dead God. They like a God who's far off. They like a God who's not involved in their life. But the Bible gives very clear indication that when two or three have gathered in his name, God says through his son Jesus, I am in your midst. In the Old Testament, when Israel would assemble together for holy convocations, it says that God says, I will come and visit my people, and I will walk in their midst. I like to picture in my mind the Spirit of God just walking between the rows this morning. And God has all your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. He posts it. He knows everything about you. And see, when I talk about a living God that knows you, a lot of times people get really insecure, get really frightened. They're afraid. Oh, no, I don't want God to know me. No, no, please. So we'd rather have a dead God. We'd rather have a God who's far off. But God's our Father, and He wants to draw near to us. He wants to be with us. He wants to investigate the, the things of your life. He wants to weed out the things that are corrupting your soul and the things that are bringing misery into your life. God wants to bring wholeness and health into your soul. So we gather here this morning, we're hearing this message, and we're going through this, and I'm here to say to you that I'm depending on the Holy Spirit to be here with his people, that he'll draw you in, that he'll speak to you, that he'll minister to you, that he'll touch you, that's supernatural. And we've had report after report of people coming into this facility and just being healed of physical problems. No one even prayed for them. We just believe God as they just come in that God will just meet every need. We pray as a staff every week we're praying and believing God that every person that comes through these doors that's, that physically, relationally, spiritually, financially, in every realm that you'll be blessed that God will just touch and meet every need. We're believing God that the living God will come and visit with you and I. We're believing as Peter said you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God that you'll come to that same confession of faith where you realize that Jesus is my Lord, that I've given my life to Him, that I'm no longer living life for self, but I'm living for Him. Which leads me to the second, one of the most incredible revelations you can have, is not only does faith speaks, but God wants you to have His kind of faith, the God kind of faith. You see, when you have the God kind of faith, you begin to speak like God speaks. Why is that? Because God wants you to imitate Him. Now let me tell you how this works. I go out and play golf every once in a while, some of you think that's all preachers do, but I go out and play golf every once in a while, and I watch guys on TV, and I watch them play. In fact, my son-in-law got me tickets when we were on a vacation earlier in August, and I got to go watch pro golfers up close. Those guys make look hitting a golf ball so easy. It's unbelievable. Man, they just barely swing, and that ball just flies, just straight, and all this, right? It's just unbelievable. I get out there, and it doesn't work that way. Ball goes this way, that way. And then I remember a story. I was with my dad one time. It was so embarrassing. My dad and I, we went to play golf one time, and my dad didn't like golf, but he did it just to, just to kind of just get us off his back. So he goes out there. If you've ever played golf, the first tee, if you've got a backup, all the people who are waiting to play sit there and watch the group that's hitting the first shot. So my dad gets up there, and he tees up the ball, and he swings and misses. And he swings and misses again. And then third swing, he just tops the ball and it just dribbles off. 
We're like, Dad, just pick the ball up because all these people are waiting. I says, we'll go down the fairway and we'll get, we'll get another ball. He goes, bless God, I paid my money. I'm going to get my shot. So he goes back, puts his ball back down. We're like, oh, no, Dad, please. But the point is, is that because I'm playing golf, I am nowhere close to what professional golfers are. So when I talk about having the God kind of faith, and you see Jesus, and Jesus did some amazing things, you're trying to imitate Jesus, but you're not Jesus. Like I find out when I'm playing golf, I am not a professional golfer. I may be making the same swing, trying to get the same motion, but I'm nowhere near where those guys are. So when I talk to you about having the God kind of faith, listen to me. Is that God wants you to grow in your faith. God wants you to grow in your knowledge. God wants you to grow in your love for Jesus. He wants you to grow. you got to start somewhere. And faith is that start. So faith is speaking what God says. Listen to what it says in Mark 11, 22 and 23. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, or literally, have the faith of God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Three times this verse is talk about your speech, and one time it talks about your belief. God wants you to speak it, speak it, speak it. They gave this story one time that there was a guy who founded the Methodist Church named John Wesley. He was a missionary. He came over from England to America. He was on a boat sailing over to witness to the Indian tribes in America to, to win the, the lost savages to Christ. And on the way over, the, the ship hit a storm, and he was with a group of other Christians called Moravians. And in the midst of the storm, it looked like the boat was literally going to implode in the storm. John was terrified for his life. He saw the men, women, and children of the Moravians. They were below the deck, and they were singing, worshiping, and they had such a peace and tranquility. And he went up to the leader and says, what's wrong with you people? We're about to die, and not one of you seems afraid. And they said, well, if we die, we go be with our Lord. He said, where do you find a peace like that? Where do you find a, a security like that? He says, I'm going over to be a missionary to the Indians, and I don't have what you have. And the wise leader of the Moravians said this. He says, you just keep preaching it till you get it. You just keep saying it till you get it. And one day it will register, and you will get what you're saying. I think that's sometimes why the Lord has us say it three times and believe once. Brother Kenneth Hagin shared this. It's a tremendous revelation. You speak it, you speak it, you speak it. The important thing is, is to get a word from God, not a word out of your own mind or a word out of your own desires. To get a rhema word, Romans 10, 17, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This happened first service, and these people over here are still in darkness. Would you pray for them? They need, they need help. If I could just, just pray for these guys over here. They're, they're sitting in darkness. Okay, there we go. So one of the things that God is after is God is after for his people. He's after for his people to speak the word, speak the word, speak the word. There's something that happens when you begin to take the word of God and inject it into any situation you're facing. It's amazing how it changes you and it changes others. I share this all the time, but just real quick, I used to play basketball. That was used to play basketball. And it was so much fun to be out there playing, running up down the court playing basketball, and some guy would miss an easy shot or do something, and they'd just start screaming, you know, GD, or they'd be saying, oh, Jesus Christ, and they're doing all this stuff. And I just realized, you know what? They brought up religion. <laughs> so I'm going to bring up my religion. And this is what, I'm serious, it happened all the time. We'd be out there playing, and something would happen, and I'd go, praise the Lord. The whole game just stopped. And people just stared at me like, what is wrong with you? And then one guy said, man, don't bring your religion out here. I'm here to play some ball. I said, I didn't bring it up first. You did. You mentioned Jesus. You mentioned God. I'm adding on to it. You're cursing him. I'm praising him. Praise the Lord. Yeah. People go, what is wrong with you? I just want to say, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just God has some incredible things. You curse him, I praise him. And let me just say this too. This is, let me just balance that out. Don't just say praise the Lord when good things happen for you. Like after playing basketball and you make a shot, you're like, praise the Lord. Well, why don't you praise him when you miss the shot? 
Why don't you praise him when they call a foul on you and you didn't foul the guy? Why don't, they, why don't you praise him? You know what, you know what I'm saying is that you've got to be able to praise him at all times. But it's just so much fun. I just still remember just says, those guys are cursing and swearing, and I say praise the Lord, and everybody just stops. Like I'm the weirdo. I'm not the weirdo. You're the weirdo. Jesus died for you. I didn't die for you. Don't curse his name. Bless his name. Honor his name. Give your life to his name. Live for him. It's the joy of life. Can I get an amen? I'm on the right side. Come on, church. All right, we're wrapping up. Here we go. Proverbs 18, 20, on the tongue has power in life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. James 3, 6 tells you that our tongue sets the destiny of your life. Life and death are in the power of what? The tongue. Your speech determines where you're going. Listen to this as the music team comes up. We're going to finish up in Acts 27, 21 through 25. Let me give you a background on this story. The Bible tells you these stories to give you and I hope in our circumstances. One of the things that God is after is when you're going through bad stuff in life, what comes out of your mouth? A lot of times, for a lot of us, it's just cursing and swearing. Even born-again, spirit-filled Christians. And God is wanting us to be a people who learn how to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Out of the overflow or the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can always gauge where your walk is with God by what comes out of your mouth. And I can say this as a pastor, as your pastor, what does it call me, pastor, called church, whatever. There's a lot of times I'm embarrassed by the things that come out of my mouth. And not just when I'm driving behind the car and my, down the road. And it just tells me, Mitch, you're running on empty. Mitch, you've kind of not spent your time with the Lord that you need to get filled with his life. Somewhere you've kind of walked away from the life and the spirit that you need to get back attached to. So your speech will help you identify where you're at with Christ. So here's the Apostle Paul. He was given an assignment to go and be on a missionary trip. He's going. He gets arrested. He gets in prison. He makes an appeal. He's going to Caesar. He's on a boat. He tells the captain. He tells the owner of the boat, do not set sail. This is dangerous water. We do not need to go. They didn't listen to him, and they went anyway. So the boat gets caught up in a hurricane, like Hurricane Irma. It's just, he's stuck. And he goes on, so we're going to pick up the story. Let's hear what it says this. It goes on to say, after they had gone a long time without food, the people on the ship, they actually were fasting for two weeks. The sailors were so depressed, they couldn't see any sun or stars at night. They were caught in this whirlwind. Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel, the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. If you were a Roman soldier sent to guard Paul, or if you're part of the garrison that was on that ship, wouldn't you have been thrilled to have a man of God tell you, in the midst of that storm, you're going to be saved? Wouldn't you have been thankful there was somebody that knew how to hear from God? They could speak in the midst of your storm in life and tell you you're going to be okay. Wouldn't you want to have somebody who's connected to God to stand before you and say, you know what, I serve the living God. And I believe it's going to be just as he told me, not one life will be lost in this disastrous choice we made to set sail. Wouldn't it be great to have a church where people just hear from God and just anchored and just no matter what storms are going on in your life, that you have people that say, you know what, I believe it's going to be just as God told me. Because he goes on to say, he says, an angel of the living God that I serve has spoken to me. Paul, you're going to stand before Caesar. You're going to give that testimony. And Paul, because of you, all the other men on the boat, all 276 of them, they're going to be saved. I can see it in my mind's eye so clear. The church is to be like an ark, a refuge. For people in our culture. I'm meeting with people every week. Drug addiction, alcoholism, 
I can go through all this long list of stuff going on. We are being bombarded as a culture with stuff. And we need the men and women of God to be like Paul's in the midst of a storm. You hear from God, you get his word, and you stand on it. And you speak it, and you declare it, and you let the world know, Jesus, the living God, has spoken to me, and it will be to me just as he said. And God would do some amazing things. So one of the greatest confessions you can ever make, we'll go back to this, is in Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord, and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. As the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he says, Timothy says, you're going to take hold of eternal life because of the good confession you made in the presence of many witnesses. In this room right here, we have witnesses of people who've given their life to Christ. And we're going to take a minute, I'm going to have you in an altar call, but I'm just going to give you a chance. If you'd like to make that declaration, it's not Jesus is Lord. It's Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Randy, if you put those pictures up, I, got, I want to close with this. Got a couple of pictures here that uh, mean a lot to me. The young man on our left was Nate Bullock. He passed away this past summer in a tragic truck accident. He just graduated from high school, been out of high school for a month when he died. The lady that's in the picture was his high school principal. Her name is Jane Tarbox All. And I'm going to give you a little background because Jane just passed away this past, uh, yesterday. And that my wife and I were campus ministers in Bloomington, Indiana, when we met Jane. We met Jane, and Jane was uh, a crazy college kid. And we're talking back in the early 80s. Jane, in fact, when Jane gave her heart to Christ, none of the staff wanted to get close to her because everybody was scared of her. She had crazy hair and crazy lifestyle. I mean, I won't go through all the stuff. But when she gave her heart to Christ, she gave her heart to Christ completely and totally. In fact, when we moved from Bloomington up here to start the campus work for, you know, I told you I was a campus minister for seven years here at Penn State. I said, Jane said, please can I leave Bloomington? I'm going to come with you guys. I'm going to be a part. And we prayed and felt like Jane should come. And so she did. And she was actually like a nanny. She went with us on vacation. My two oldest daughters uh, call her Aunt Jane. That Jane spent all kind of time with our family. Jane got married to her husband, Rick, had three kids. And Jane and Rick all just been tremendous witnesses in our community. And Jane just stepped out into eternity yesterday. So I'm sure she's with Nate. I'm sure they're in heaven. I'm sure they're having fellowship. But I'm just saying for those of us who know Jane and Rick, Rick it's just such a shock. And I bring these pictures to you because I want you to know that you're not guaranteed anything in life. And when I make a declaration that Jesus is my Lord, the Bible says you have eternal life. Immediately, the spirit of the living God comes to live inside of you and you have your are you have eternal life. You're going to be in heaven. But there's something about that walking with Christ and declaring his lordship over your life that puts everything in perspective. I've been given a task and I've been given a mission here this side of heaven. And that's with my heart to believe in Jesus and with my mouth to confess his lordship. It means that my life is to be filled every day with serving Jesus and loving Jesus and helping others understand who he is and what he's all about your task in life will be similar you may have another job another circumstance another mission but it's still the same that's introducing others to christ we're living in a desperate times as a culture we're living in times where people need to hear a living god speak through his people we're living in a situation where the people of god need to declare what jesus has done in their life so having said that we did this first service and i'll do it again if you would like to make that declaration that Jesus Christ is my Lord, you're free at this time if you'd like to stand up and declare, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Make your declaration. You can stand up. Just declare it.
I guess everybody is standing. I'm not really looking around. If you guys just bow your heads for a moment. We're going to say it together. We're going to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Let's say it together. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Father God, we just pray before you today as we're standing that truly your Lordship will be a part of our lives. That God, we'd make choices, Lord, that reflect that commitment to you. Father, I thank you for the privilege of serving in a congregation. Lord, that we can declare your Lordship over our lives. That Jesus, you're our shepherd, we're your sheep. That Jesus, we can declare this morning that by faith in you, that God, that we've been adopted into the family of God. That we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're now, God, your children, we're your sons and daughters. So, Father, I believe this morning as we confess your Lordship that, God, you're breaking fear and apathy out of our lives. That, God, I believe this morning as we confess your Lordship that, God, let that passion and hunger to know you and to grow with you, God, let it ignite in our hearts. Father, I believe this morning as we've declared your Lordship that, God, you just loosed within us or just that desire to speak your word in situations. As the Apostle Paul was on the ship that was in a a shipwreck situation, as David ran to his Goliath, his as Pharaoh was addressed by Moses and Aaron, God, as Timothy made that good confession, Father, let us be of the same faith. Let us be of the same hope. Let us be of the same nature. Lord, most of all, as the Apostle Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, let us be a people that know and examine and understand that we serve a living God. Church, one last time, can you say it with me just with a loud shout? Jesus Christ is my Lord. One more time. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Give him a shout of praise. Shout of praise and honor and glory to Jesus. Praise the Lord.